And Susan, thank you for taking part in being here today. Uh, and it is your show, go ahead. Okay, thanks very much, Matt, for um, giving me the opportunity to share the information about the foundation. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us or terribly familiar with us, uh, we're a private grant-making foundation that was established by Bill Pomeroy in 2005. And as you can see on the screen, we sort of have a two-part mission for history for life. So we are committed to supporting the celebration and preservation of community history and to raising awareness and supporting research and improving the quality of care for patients and their families who are facing a blood cancer diagnosis. Um, but of course today, we're gonna to talk about historic markers. I uh, just quickly go over the existing programs that we have. Again, for those of you who may be new uh, historians or uh, are not very familiar with our programs, um, it's, uh, first on the left, um, we have, of course, as Matt mentioned, the classic blue and yellow markers um, that help you recognize the unique contributions that your communities have made to New York and to the national history. And this one is the Syracuse and Shenango Valley Railroad, which is in Erieville. Um, I believe it's right next to the town of Nelson Garage. Um, so, and since then the foundation has expanded to offer several nationwide and state focused historic marker programs. Um, in addition to our traditional historic marker program, we established a national register grant program in 2013. Um, that's the brown and white one that you see all the way over on the right of your screen um, to support and commemorate public properties and districts on the national register of historic places. And this program offers both a traditional roadside signage like you see here, or we also offer two styles of commemorative plaques um, if you prefer to have it on the building or sometimes with churches, they prefer to have it um, in the vestibule um, as you enter as opposed to out front. Um, this one happens to be on Route 26 um, in Cincinnati next to Heritage Hall. And it's a very easy grant program and we really wish more people would take advantage of it. Uh, you can apply anytime throughout the year, there's no deadline. Um, if you're already on the national register, that's all you need. There's no primary sources to prove it. Um, we just need a copy of that letter that you got saying that you were placed on the national register. For some reason, you can't find that letter because it was decades ago that you were placed on the national register. Let us know. Um, we have online resources where we can help you find that for the proof. Um, and at this time, the funding is for public properties and districts, uh, not private residences or commercial properties. And the one in the center, which you're probably, especially Sue is gonna recognize because she was at that dedication. Uh, legends and lore is designed to commemorate legends and folklore um, as part of our heritage. So in general, folklore are the stories passed on from one person to another, often from generation to generation. And legends are traditional stories that usually concern historical events and often involve heroes, heroines, villains, and sometimes the supernatural. Um, it covers genres such as myths, tall tales, place name anecdotes, uh, folklorist love, um, and superstitions. And this is a national program that has proven very popular and it's really growing all the time. Uh, this particular marker is in Morrisville. So another national program is our historic transportation canals. Um, and the historic transportation canals, you know, think of these as precursors to the interstate highways. Um, it must be a transportation canal, not an irrigation canal. Um, and it can also include associated structures like you see here. So this is in Jordan. Um, it's near the Jordan Elbridge Middle School. It's the lock tender's house uh, moved from the canal site in order to preserve it um, a couple decades ago. And it has since been restored and it is particularly rare because it's not the kind of thing that you can imagine people really wanted to keep. Imagine having to live in that during the lock tender season. It's basically, you know, one plank of wood thick. And uh, so, you know, these things just got knocked down or, or taken for or spare wood um, when they weren't needed anymore. Um, the other marker is the DNH Canal, the Delaware and Hudson Canal. And this particular one is in Barryville in Highland, Sullivan County. And it sits right on the Delaware River, Route 97. And that section of Route 97 was the DNH Canal, just been filled in and made into a highway. So another offshoot of our historic marker program is the Patriot Burials Marker that you can see an example on the right. 
Um, the foundation partnered with the Empire State Sons of uh, the American Revolution to mark the often forgotten or unrecognized burial sites of patriots uh, who fought in the Revolutionary War. So you'll note that we you know, did a specially designed logo. It's an adaptation of the ESS SAR logo um, and really bright colors. Uh, we had the specially designed for the program. And the gentleman you see there um, is from uh, the Thousand Islands chapter, Parks Honeywell. And he was actually instrumental. Uh, he came to us and said, is there anything special we could do to mark Revolutionary War veterans' graves? And that started the whole ball rolling. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about themes as I go along. Um, we just gave one to Onondaga County. Of course, the marker's not up yet. It's still uh, being made. And it's gonna go into the Walnut Grove Cemetery on Onondaga Hill in Syracuse. So we were pretty excited to finally have one in central New York. Um, and just a reminder with all these programs, uh, once your application is approved, it's a fully funded grant program that covers the cost of the marker, the poll and the shipping. The only thing your organization or your town is responsible for is the installation of the marker. Um, so in total, we've given out about, I think we're up to 1300, a little more than 1300 markers across all our different programs. Um, and we've given out more than 700 of the, the blue and yellow historic markers in New York State. Uh, one of the things I want to share with you, which is fairly new, um, hopefully some of you are familiar with it, and some, but some of you may not be, um, we have this great resource now on our website, and it's an interactive digital map. Um, it's one of the most popular features on our website, and you can see the little yellow arrow in the center there shows you where you can click to get to the marker map. Uh, it, it illustrates all Pomeroy-funded markers across the United States, um, and we go as far as Canada. And it also provides additional information about each marker subject matter. Um, let me click to the next slide. And you can see, so here's an example of a page. Um, you can filter it by program, um, by geography, by keywords. Um, you can see the information it gives you. It tells you what, what um, program the marker was awarded under, um, exactly where it's located. It gives you the GPS coordinates so that you can find it. It also tells you the grant recipient, and we give you, um, you know, the, the inscription. Um, th this one has some fairly short information on it, but some of them have a lot of information that we add. Um, sometimes there's even videos if we can find something um, that connects to it. And a lot of times, you know, you, you send us, uh, many applicants send us actually more information than we need, but it's wonderful to be able to add that to these pages. And it's also a great resource for you if you're trying to be inspired as to what you know kind of marker you could do for your community. You know, look through the map and see what other markers are there. It can also give you some ideas of how to word those markers, the type of information that we're looking for, um, and where those markers can be placed. So it's something to just you know browse through if you're if you're just looking for some inf inspiration. Um, this marker happens to be in Memphis, which is the town of Van Buren uh, in Onondaga County. What's new? So National Historic Marker Day turned out to be so much more. <laughs> this really went viral. Um, this was kind of a something that we missed doing it last year. We said we we're going to do it this year. And I don't know if anybody participated in it. April 30th was last Friday. Um, we did a big news blast. Um, we put up a video with uh, Ryan, who is our incredible facilities and IT person. Um, he went out and you know gave us a little demonstration on, on cleaning a historic marker. Um, and we had this program picked up as far away as a news station in Las Vegas. Um, so we were really excited about um, how this went over. And if you did participate, we'd love to see photos of it. Um, tomorrow, we're going to do a big splash on Facebook and Twitter, um, some of these photos that people have sent us. You can either post it with the hashtag um, National Historic Marker Day, or you can email it directly to info at wgpfoundation.org and we'll post it for you if you're not on social media. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different things we can do. Uh, you know, some of those markers, not, not necessarily the ones that were given recently, but some of the old state markers, you know, some of them don't even have any paint left on them. Um, so we're trying to give people some, some tips as to, you know, how they can 
um, the, you know, clean them up, uh, places they might be able to go to get them fixed, or what the pain is if you want to paint it yourself. Um, some of them are so covered by roadside weeds and bushes and so forth that you can't even see them. So we really wanted to get people, you know, encourage people to get out there and, you know, cut them back a little bit. Um, and maybe even straighten that marker that's been a victim of a snowplow, you know, one too many times. Um, so while we're talking about maintenance, um, a lot of you were very generous with your feedback on the, intern the uh, informal survey um, that Matt sent out about our proposed marker refurbishment grant program. We did do a pilot program or four or five markers um, with the company in Syracuse and they came out looking really great. Unfortunately, the company felt that this was not something their business could handle at this time. So we've had to put the program on hold for now. Um, but however, we saved all your comments and they have been read, they all went to the trustees and we're just figuring out how we can move forward um, with this program. But we do have a new national marker program starting this summer and you get to be the first recipients of an official announcement of this program. Uh, it's our Hungry for History marker program. And this will celebrate regional or local dishes that have existed for more than 25 years before the current date, before the application date. Doesn't include brand names, so no markers for Nestle's chocolate or, or Grandma was Grandma Brown's um, baked beans, uh, anything like that. But um, this is a mock-up of our pilot grant, which was with the Onondaga Historical Association, um, and it's going to be celebrating salt potatoes, and it will be over at the Salt Museum um, at uh, Onondaga Lake Parkway. So we're really excited about this. Um, this will be, again, be a national program. So, you know, you get to be the first people to hear about this because nothing has gone out about it as of yet. It's taken us a little longer and we've, it has its own specially designed marker and logo for it. So it's something for you to start thinking about and hopefully you'll see the press releases coming out um, about that soon. So themes. Um, some of you have, you know, have been, uh, who've applied for markers and with us before know that we've done some themes in the past. And um, Ryan mentioned um, the, some photos of over at Radisson where the, um, the New York Ordnance Works were located. So Bonnie, you're getting a lot of uh, attention today. <laughs> Here's the marker that actually went in in that location um, that went up in 2015 for the Ordnance Works. Um, we also are working at the moment, and this grant is just finishing up, but we partnered with um, the National Coalition of Women's History Sites um, to create a National Votes for Women Trail. And this was uh, to celebrate the fight for women's suffrage that led to the, to, to the ratification, I should say, of the 19th Amendment. Um, this particular marker is in Union Springs. Um, and another person that we, another organization that we partnered with was the National Lafayette Trail. So you're gonna start seeing some of these Lafayette tour markers around and uh, they celebrate um, General Lafayette's farewell tour when he was invited as the nation's guest um, by John Quincy, President John Quincy Adams to tour the United States, which at the time was 24 states and, and the District of Columbia. Um, in 1824 and 1825. So a gentleman named Julian Eicher, who is from France, has partnered um, with the French Council um, and several other organizations. And we are funding the installation of these markers that are going from Maine to, I think the southernmost one is South Carolina, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's pretty awesome, the places he's you know, putting these. Some of these are on military bases. There's going to be one at Niagara Falls. Um, you're going to see quite a few of them along the Erie Canal because the general did use the Erie Canal as he had his own private canal boat and he used that for transportation. Um, so this was pretty exciting and, and it's gotten a lot of national press. In fact, Julian also has a, he does call Follow the Frenchman, <laughs> where he does this wonderful blog um, where he films marker dedications and talks about the different little towns that he's going to, um, where the general visited. And this was a really big uh, celebration um, when General Lafayette came through. In fact, we were reading some, uh, some of the material he sent us where um, people, you know, he was, he was, people waited along the sides of the canal um, 
uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember the, what county it was in right now, and it's escaped me, but literally built bonfires because they knew his, his, his canal boat wasn't going to come past till like two o'clock in the morning. And they were lining both sides of the canal and, and he was coming back from Buffalo and I think he was asleep and all these people just started cheering. There were all these bonfires, a um, little bit of celebratory gunfire. And his son went in and woke him up and said, you have to come out and see this. And he came out and here's the whole, you know, canal either side lined with people cheering and waving just to see him. So it's, it's something that, you know, we never really learned about in school, um, but it was huge at the time. So some of the other um, organizations that we're working with for a number of years, we've worked with the um, state of Ohio um, and funded Ohio historical markers. We're working with the uh, North Carolina Office of Archives and Histories, uh, African American Heritage Commission to fund a civil rights trail of markers. Um, while we're still here is really interesting. This is sort of a grassroots nonprofit organization that formed in Harlem um, to mark some of the uh, important sites um, in the history of Harlem, um, while people who remember these things are still here um, and can give testimonial. Um, we're, we're also working with the Wayne County Historian's Office to celebrate the Wayne County Bicentennial. And they will be putting up a marker at the courthouse and one in each town that uh, celebrates when that town um, was established and how it got its name. And there's also a small group of folks in Oneida County, somebody listening maybe on this, this part of this, this uh, um, committee um, to, to uh, commemorate the Underground Railroad as it ran through Oneida County. Um, they are working with the National Park Services uh, Network to Freedom Trail, which you may have heard of. Um, so, you know, the, the, we have plenty of ideas for themes. And if, you're, if you have an idea for a theme that you might want for your town, for your county, even something that could be statewide, even something that could be nationwide. We'd love to talk to you. Um, you know, you can see with some of these, we've even done specially designed logos um, to fit with the theme. So, you know, if you're looking for funding for something to, you know, celebrate, again, celebrate your county's bicentennial, um, you know, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, let's look at the um, grant schedule. Here's the schedule for region seven through nine. Um, the application materials will be available uh, November 1st online. Uh, for those of you who have gotten grants from us before, uh, here's, a, here's something that's new and very important. As of this current grant round that's open, which is region one through three, the LOI is now required part of the application. We will not be accepting applications where you did not submit, previously submit an LOI. Um, our our Marker program has grown so much um, that we're finding that we're spending a lot of time, especially with people who were new to the grant program, um, helping them get the application through when it's something that would have been very helpful to them if they had submitted the letter of, of inquiry first and we could have commented on that. Um, you know, we do hire the consultants to help out, but it's we found, we're, we're finding that as the program is going growing, um, we're not able to get through some of these applications because people are unaware um, or not really sure what it is they need. So we really want to help you and, and having you submit that LOI in the beginning is really going to help you have a successful, a more successful um, opportunity to, as a, at a grant um, for a marker. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we're really, uh, you know, happy to be here. Um, we're, we love being able to help people celebrate and commemorate their community's history, what's important to you, what's in, important to, the, um, to your community. And we have a, a new feature on our website. Um, you can go on the website and click on receive grant and news updates, and you can receive them as, as emails. We have a regular email newsletter that will go out. Um, a lot of you, uh, this way you don't have to keep going to our website to get information. A lot of people are not on social media or they're not on the social media that we use because social media is growing so much. So if you'd like to receive regular emails, um, especially at your, you know, maybe your work address as opposed to your personal address, you can click on receive um, grant and news updates. Um, and we will send you regular emails to let you know what's going on, let you know when different um, uh, uh, the marker um, uh, grant rounds are opening up, the canals and so forth. 
So um, with that, uh, anybody have, people have questions or comments or um, I'm happy to answer any questions or give you more information. We got some questions in the chat. So uh, Susie Parsons asked if Patriot markers can be placed inside cemeteries. Yes, yes, they can be as long as they're, um, what we're looking for, obviously you have to have the, the, the you know, cemeteries permission. They can be placed inside cemeteries, but what we're looking for is if it's not at the entrance to the cemetery, it's at least in a prominent location where people will see it. Like you don't have to go all the way to the far corner for that person's grave to find it. We want people to notice it and come over and, and read it um, because that's, that's what's really important to it. So um, yes, they can be, but a lot of it is up to the, you know, the discretion of the trustees as to, as to where it's, um, where you want to place it. Okay. Uh, Anne asked, is Pomeroy planning on anything for the 250th anniversary of the U.S. in 2026? Yes, we are. And we're working on that right now. Um, a couple of things that we're, well, it's a couple different things we're working on. Um, there's a possibility, and I don't know if this will happen because we're just talking about it. There's a possibility of expanding um, Patriot burials nationwide. Um, but there's a couple of things in the works and I don't want to give them away, but, <laughs> but yes, we are, we are working on that right now. So hopefully we'll have something to announce uh, within the year. Uh, there is also a planning committee that the state historian is doing uh, for the, the, I think it's called the sesquicentennial. Is that right? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. Or ses no, it's like <laughs> sesquicentennial, -sem -sesquicentennial, I believe is what it is, isn't it? I think that's, I'm not positive. That, that, that's 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 too many words for me. Yeah. Uh, all right, um, Lori Dewitt asks, "Hungry for history? Could you do something for an ongoing chicken barbecue? One more one that's been going on for more than fifty years." Um, what they're really looking for with Hungry for History, I don't want to say no, um, because obviously it's an evolving program. You know, these are things are new, and as people come to us with ideas. Um, right now, the, the idea is not so much a, a food event, like a picnic type thing, but an actual dish itself. Um, so we're looking for something that has been, you know, so basically we're looking, it could be a hot a dish, a cold dish, something with two or more ingredients um, as the salt potatoes was. So it's not really, we weren't celebrating Syracuse as the place where salt potatoes were served or any particular bar, because there's a lot of record of the different bars and taverns that were serving them all the way back to the, oh, I don't know, 1880s, 1870s. But the dish itself is what we're looking for. Um, oh, in this scenario, it would make more sense to, if you've never looked up the story of the, the fireman's chicken marinade, that is a real story. Cornell University created that marinade because they needed to find a way to get people to eat chicken. <laughs> if you think I'm kidding, look it up. There's been like oh, 10 articles yeah, on. Sounds like, great. Sounds like something that, Cornell would do. <laughs> that, that's why it's called Cornell chicken marinade. Um, so, oh. so you're looking more for the Utica greens, the, the story oh. of the salt potatoes. Right. Uh, I'm sure Rochester will not get a garbage plate one. We, we know that won't happen. Uh, yeah. So but more <laughs> the kind of prominent historical food. Right, and, and think about the stuff that came about um, as a result of World War I and World War II. I mean, the one that sticks in my head right now, of course, is England, but it, something along those lines. Did anybody ever hear of the National Loaf? That they, yeah, okay, so the National Loaf, which was it, during World War II, and because they didn't have that the refined flour and so forth to share. And, you know, people were like, look, this thing is horrible. It was like eating cardboard. But today it's like, wow, it's healthy, you know, because <laughs> it's made with all these more wonderful, more wonderfully healthy ingredients than the plain old white flour. So we're looking at those kind of things. There may have things been things that came along. Now we're not looking for particular brands. So we wouldn't put up a marker, say, for Grandma Brown's um, beans in, in which are, it's in Mexico, I believe, Mexico, New York is where the factory is. We we wouldn't put that in, but if you're looking at, you know, the first place that um, a particular dish came about and then was, you know, of course, 
things like um, salt potatoes, you know, you hint waddles, you know, you have this different, we won't, we don't give a marker for the particular brand, but the dish preceded the brand. So, you know, chicken speedies, chicken riggies, all yeah. these fun recipes that are unique to a community. Exactly. Exactly. So beef on whack. Here we go. Beef on whack. Bring it on. There you go. Um, <laughs> All right, so we have a question. Do you have any certain requirements for legends and lore? The legends and lore um, in New York State, and I would encourage you to go to the website and look at the legends and lore page because there's a whole page that discusses, you know, what is a myth? What is folklore? Um, those kind of things. What the big thing for legends and lore is that it, we're not looking for failed historical markers. We're not looking for a historical event, event that could be proven, but you just can't find the documentation for it. What we're looking for is something that it may have actually happened, but then reach the next level. Uh, think about, you know, um, it was a John, John Brown. Well, this isn't in New York, but think about John Brown, this, you know, the steel driving man and how he cut that tunnel through the bridge. He was a real man, but what he did became legendary. So the action became legendary. And what folklorists say is that the, it, when a lot of times when the event itself became legendary, it's because it's either a lesson or a warning <laughs> to other people um, about what can happen to you. Um, sometimes there might be you know, a story about someone who you know, died through unfortunate events. And now they say, oh, if you go to that rock at midnight and say her name, 13 curves um, in Onondaga County, you know, it, that the someone getting killed on 13 curves could have been an actual person um, getting killed there. But the story of how she comes back and, you know, you see her in her wedding gown obviously is, you know, a legend or, or folklore. So those are the, those are the kind of things we're looking for, but there's a really great explanation on the website about different things. And you are more than welcome to um, contact us if you're not really sure. Um, and we can talk to you about it. Sometimes it's just a case of tweaking the text a little bit to find that actual legend. And our folklorists love, ha love the way um, things got place names. We've got, you know, Cat Town Road, we've got Bed Bug Hill. We've got lots of these great legends and lore, lore um, things for how things got their actual names today. Um, and you can see those on our, again on that the marker map that I talked about. So I have to ask, because you touched base on this, could you, I don't recall you kind of going through it, could you kind of touch base on some of the four history grants that you've given to give idea, people ideas of those projects? Okay, so you're talking about not the, the, the non-marker. The non-marker grant, correct. Yeah. Um, there's, I'm trying to think, we, those special interest grants that we do, I mean, we've given, some of them were through um, Museum Association of New York. So they were the actual grant recipients. So I don't have a list of those um, with me because they're not on our site because they're actually, the grant actually came from Manny and not, even though we funded the grant. Um, but there's a lot of different things that sometimes don't fit in, you know, somewhere else. Uh, you know, you probably saw when, when COVID started, you know, a lot of the things, um, that people needed, people didn't need these huge grants to you know, do a $25,000 digitization project if you're just a small town historical society. Sometimes all you need is a microphone reader. Sometimes all you need is better internet access. And what we, those four history grants are more for how are you making your collections more accessible to the public? Um, it, does it allow you to upgrade your internet system? Um, does it allow, like with, with during the pandemic we, pandemic, we did things specifically for like in upgrading um, security systems and things like that. Um, but what their trustees are really looking for are things that protect your collections and make them more accessible to, to the public um, in some way, shape or form. Um, we've given grants to have uh, some collections digitized that were too small to qualify for some of these huge digitization grants that are given out like on the federal level. Um, I always like to tell people, just give us, if, if you're not sure, um, give us a call because the trustees are always, always interested in hearing what it is you need. Um, we've given out some grant money to fix roofs 
on um, historic buildings that are owned by the local historic, have to be, it's owned by local historical sign. We don't give many to give out to, for a private property. But to fix a roof on a historic building where the, his, where the historical society is housed and has their collection, um, you know, you never know. It, it, we're, we're trying, they're really trying to sort of fill a niche um, that those, those little, I mean, I just need $1,500 to finish this project, you know. Um, and where do you go for that kind of money? I mean, those are the kind of things I really like to see. So did, did I answer your question, Matt? Or Yeah, I, I, it's one of those weird things that exists in the ether, but you don't really know what it is without asking. It is, and that's why I encourage you to call. I mean, there, the, Paula is happy to talk to you. Paula Miller, our executive director, she's happy to talk to you about it. Um, you know, she's a very nice person. The worst she can do is say no, I guess, but... Um, like I said, you know, they've given money for they've given money for for scanners. They've given money to have roofs repaired. They've given money to have um, security systems upgraded. Um, they just actually they just gave a mo gave money to um, I think it was if it, I'm not sure if it was a lighthouse in Saugerties, but it was downstate where you can only get out to the which lighthouse is open. It's it's owned by a 501c3. It's open to the public, but you can only get out during low tide. So if the tide comes in, you're, you're kind of stuck unless you got hip waders on to get back to the mainland. Um, and they just had some planks down. Well, they just gave some money to build a, a better bridge. So you don't have to worry about the tide coming in. So you can get in and out to the to this historic site. Things like that, that you just need a few, maybe need a few thousand dollars for. And, and there's nobody else who funds those kind of things. Um, they're always happy to, to listen to what you have to say. As always, Susan, you did a wonderful job. Thank you for coming and taking part with us. I'm going to turn off the recording now.